Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Charlotte Vincer, and I'm part of the theatrical programming team here at TIFF. I'd like to thank you all for joining us for this afternoon's screening of Skagwe Kuna, Edge of the Knife. On behalf of TIFF, we'd like to thank the director, Asuma, for providing us with this film and with so many great films throughout the year. To begin, I'd like to acknowledge that today's event is taking place on the treaty territory of the Mississaugas of New Credit, the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and the Huron-Wendat. We're very fortunate to have special guests with us here this afternoon. Co-director Gwai Edenshaw will be here with us after the film for a Q&A. This will be moderated by Shane Belcourt. Shane is an award-winning and CSA-nominated filmmaker based in Toronto. I also want to mention that we have a special video introduction that will play before the film from co-director Helen Haig Brown. Now to introduce the film, please welcome me. Please join me in welcoming co-director Gwai Edenshaw. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I won't say too much uh, because I'll be up here again in short order to answer any of the questions that uh, come up. Um, the movie that you're going to watch is is the uh, result of of a lot of people in our community coming together and and telling a story that's that's really uh, a very familiar story for all of us. But the way we told it, we sort of have uh, a number of threads. Uh, pushing through the story so if you when you're watching and you're thinking about a question you might ask but it doesn't seem to to follow like the overarching narrative you might be right anyway so just go ahead and ask it <clears throat> uh, there it's also deals with some uh, difficult subject matter so uh, so I just like to um, give you guys the head up, heads up on that so that so that you can um, be prepared to 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 watch those things. Um, yeah, thank you all for coming. And we have uh, the director coming up as well as Kenny, who worked on the score. I'll just grab this one. Everyone wants to have a seat. Yeah. Yes. Um, thank you uh, both for working on this wonderful film. Uh, I find it deeply moving uh, to view it just as a film lover. Um, obviously, uh, as an indigenous person watching the film and as a whole other intense, uh, profound, celebration and meaning to see a work like this. Uh, so Magwitch, and thank you so much for making this film, man. It's awesome. Um, I guess I wanted to start um, just from the beginning, I, I'm assuming the beginning, um, of like how did you come to know this story? How did you set it to the page with your other co-writers and sort of say, hey, here's a script, let's make this into a movie? Yeah, so Gogit uh, or Gogihit, depending on uh, which dialect you're speaking, is uh, a story that we all become familiar with from a really early age. Uh, mostly taught as, um, you know, one of the cautionary stories, like don't wander off alone or Gogit will will snatch you up. But uh, as as you get older and you become more familiar with the story, um, you learn that it's not goggy hit that you're supposed to be worried about, but it's that you worry about becoming that being. You you got to avoid entering that state. And so you had this sort of this teaching that you've always had, and then you I guess you considered what it would be like, because I mean, it didn't feel like, oh, here's this story we heard. We, it really felt like a character going through and other characters responding to this emotional place that, you know, they're losing uh, a brother or a best friend. And so like it really it was emotional bonds of all these characters. How do you sort of take what was the transfer like of was it scary? Was it like, oh, yeah, these are now they're characters. Hmm. Yeah. Um, well, 
I, I sort of skipped your question the first time. Hope, I hope I don't do it again this time. Uh, we'll just keep circling back. <laughs> we, yeah, we decided that as when we wrote this, that we were going to tell a fiction. Um, that I, I hadn't been hired as director yet. Um, we were just writing it, and and we knew that this, you know, if if we successfully launched this, that this would be the first Haida feature. And the Gogit story is one that everybody's familiar with. It's a dance. It's a story. So it's also danced uh, in almost every potlatch. Uh, it's also one of the few surviving secret society dances that we have. Uh, it was the only one that was allowed to be danced in public. Um, but, you know, we have rules around telling our stories and, you know, specifically with traditional stories, you need to be faithful in retelling them. So um, the reason we made a fiction was because we thought a new director coming in might take some liberties with it. And we figured we could, we could accept that with our own story, but, but uh, not with one of our older stories. And so that's where we, where we landed on this particular story. There were also things that we wanted to tell about it um um you know the the journey and the loss those those aspects of the of the story were also meaningful to us um did i hit it yeah absolutely <laughs> <laughs> we're out of the park bro <laughs> um and with that i was uh I saw a, a documentary that um, Christy Lane Sinclair had made for CBC, um, a behind the scenes on this film and the making of, this, of the film. And uh, one of the first title cards that came up was there's only 24 Haida speakers left. And when was the decision made that uh, not only we're going to tell this story and we're going to um, create it based on real characters and we're going to really write. It's a beautiful script. Um, when was the decision then made to be like, well, we're also going to be telling this in our language? Right from the beginning. So so me and my little brother have a production company together. And that's one of our, our main focuses is on creating material in our language. Um, the... You know, partly uh, we, we do like short animations and stuff like that. Kenny was actually involved in another one of those projects. Um, and the idea is that, um, you know, without a, with so few speakers on island, uh, a, an opportunity for immersion in the language isn't, isn't uh, ready, re ready for everybody. So they could play these animations and stuff inside of their homes uh, at any time. And so we thought that this, um, movie and, and, or movies could be an extension of that. Uh, we probably shouldn't have made, yeah, anything so intense for, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'd like to lean into this conversation and, um, uh, weigh into the fact that, uh, when we think about our speakers in our languages, we, I feel like the media sensationalizes the lack, like there's some drama around, oh, there's only 24 speakers. But if we extend those numbers out to people, and we talk about this a lot, if we extend that those numbers out to people who even like, I, you know, whatever, my Mohawk vocabulary is so small, but every now and then a word will come. And I think if we extend that out, it's a less dramatic story but it's a more real story and it allows us to feel more stronger than to say oh there's only 24 speakers because you were saying there's lots of speakers up in Alaska and and then there's the novice speakers where we, you know we only have a smattering like a pep like a little tiny bit of language but that's real too yeah everybody on Haida Gwaii speaks some Haida and, and it's sort of part of everybody's like vernacular to use mm -hmm. to use Haida language mm -hmm. um and and then in, in addition there are uh so the 24 i think we're down to about 20 now mm -hmm. fluent speakers on Haida Gwaii uh there's more in Alaska including uh the youngest fluent speaker who I think he's about 30 mm -hmm. and he was one of the cast um and came up and and was really helpful on on set as well, because 
um, like one of the issues you run into with with most of the cast being non-fluent is, uh, you know, the weather changes or or we come up with some new ideas on the fly and they aren't able to improvise their lines or, or, or shift to the changing landscape. And so having guys like Benjamin Young was, was this young fluent speaker. He, we had elders on set, w- which were very helpful, but they can't scramble up the rocks or get into these places to, to be able to help the uh, cast in their, in their thing. So, so that was amazing to have him and, and some other like advanced uh, learners uh, along with us. Mm. Um, I want to, speaking of cast, uh, we're certainly going to turn over to, uh, audiences, uh, questions from the audience. Um, I just wanted to ask about, uh, working, um, uh, with Tyler, the, I guess the lead, um, it's, uh, an incredible physical performance. I feel like he would be method on set 24. Like he, he just, it wasn't like he was just, Oh yeah, sure. Here's a quick you know performance. It felt like he was really embodying the character and it was phenomenal. Yeah. Uh, there's a, I'll try and limit myself. There's a bunch of stories ab- about <laughs> Tyler. Um, now, Tyler's my nephew, and and he his Haida name is Slinga, which means good at everything, and he really is <laughs> a very talented, talented young man. Um, you know, mostly carving. Um, what we call it is is he's able to go to the line. Mm. So if if I tell him you know, follow this plane through from the brow to to the forehead line, he'll cut that plane properly and and you don't have to hold his hand through it. Uh, and, you know, he, he followed that. He can also walk on his hands the whole length <laughs> of our pole. But uh, the other thing about Tyler is he had suffered a... A series of concussions in basketball before uh, leading into this, and and was facing some some really serious mental health issues. He's not out of the woods yet. Um, we're working with him, and he still uh, struggles. Still, you know, gets uh, uh, concussion symptoms uh, from trying to concentrate too hard or anything like that. And and so we were watching that throughout it but but it also um presented some uh production challenges as well like it, it, there were times when he was really difficult to work with um but i felt like um you know that was a piece of the story that we were telling mm-hmm. you know that that we couldn't uh give up on him even when he became uh, more challenging mm-hmm. and uh and I feel like we were rewarded for for that um, extra effort, and and uh, he really came through. It, you know, other things that he did. You'd talk about uh, method uh, when he was eating the mussels, he busted a tooth on those mussels, and uh, what wound up happening is he uh, replaced it with a gold tooth and the last go- gogit that went fully gogit out of mass that he was shot and the way that they were able to recognize him is he is the first person out of mass that to get dental work and had a gold tooth so they recognized his gold tooth so just a funny not so funny connection <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah and, and he went through those devil's club that that was that was uh you know he was pulling thorns out of himself for mm. for a long time after that uh there was a lot of dedication the uh um yeah we tried not to talk to him too much or or push him too much with direction when he was inside of that place mm. of being Augie hit um, and Kenya, how did you um, come to, uh, like, I, I know you as a singer-songwriter mm-hmm. and a performer, mm-hmm. um, and I have your records, and I love them, and they're amazing. And, and I'm just curious how you sort of, um, I guess it, this isn't like a singer-songwriter gig, you know, you're doing more a score and, and sounds and yeah. emotions, and how did you come to perform and, and create the sound? 
um, well, I have a deep love of experimental music, but it's not really what people know me for. But I, I work in experimental forms m kind of behind the scenes. And so uh, this was an opportunity to... Uh, their team was looking at several people and uh, to do the work because they had a very uh, clear idea of what they wanted for sound. They didn't really want, like, music and so a lot of times when you give a composer or so something like this they're going to make it very like music-y so that's where I was able to get the work because I have a, a not a significant database but some a database of non-music music and so that's what I applied for for this project is like a non-music music approach and um yeah and I tried to uh I tried to stay behind the story and uh, I was also, I'd like to add to the mental health conversation, which is that um, I was recovering from a, a head injury when I was um, composing and I'm still not totally out of it. Like I still can feel brain injury stuff sometimes. So it was really amazing to get to work in a story and work for these guys and towards the, goal of looking at what Tyler was dealing with both in his personal life and the story of the character because a lot of uh, for anyone who's uh, gone through brain injury issues a lot of the auditory stuff and like the world spinning and all of that stuff was a real really interesting to get to work with in sound to try to communicate those auditory malfunctions that happen with brain injuries. That's incredible work. It's I really feel it. Um, so there's some microphones here and um, some volunteers and people are going to, uh, if you want to ask a question, just wait, please, until you have a microphone and because it's being taped. Uh, so I just want to get the sound of your question into the uh, mix. Um, so I think that's the part everybody fast forward on YouTube. And <laughs> here we are. <laughs> there's a question here, I think it looks like. My, uh, Mike is in progress. How are for the film? It was amazing. Um, was it written in Haida and then translated into English? No, we we wrote it in we wrote it in English first, uh, and then um, we w went through a, a number of different people to translate it. Um, you know, with with so few uh, speakers, it a lot of anybody who's working in the language is is sort of calling on those people for for help and stuff like that. So, in Skidigit, we had the 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 whole southern end dialect of the script translated really quickly. Um, but you know, the main guy that uh, we normally work with passed away recently or just prior to uh, uh, us uh, getting involved in the script and so we had a hard time in the north uh, getting getting the translations done but but uh, we mixed that's how we drew upon some of our Alaskan relatives um, particularly Dolores uh, helped a lot and she speaks in the Masset dialect but mixed with the Alaskan dialect. Uh, first of all, congrats. It's a, an amazing film uh, from, from both of you. Um, I was wondering, as, as far as your cast was concerned, were most of them first timers? And how did you deal with that as one of the co-directors? Is, is How much direction did you have to give them? Or did you just, like you said, with Tyler, you would just let him do his thing? Yeah, uh, just about all of the actors were first time actors. Um, one of the, one of the, um, guys, we, we call them the attendants was, had some experience in acting, but none of the principal cast had any experience in acting. Dude, Dude had no experience okay. in, in acting. Um, and, uh, yeah, the, the approach was actually different with everybody. So the actress who played Slaya, uh, she really studied her, her role and 
almost all our our approach was often to try and not give too much direction on the first take and for her every first take was the best you know she um you know and with qua qua really responded to direction so so the more accurately i could describe what i wanted him to do the better uh, a job he would do at it and so so it was different right across for for everybody like that um what we did find uh was that it was good to shoot digital in this situation so that we could keep cameras running and 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 uh the more we could do that the more natural moments we could pick up and and we found any opportunities to to thread those into the narrative were you ever having um, to adjust on the fly in terms of the, the just removing lines and have them sort of acted with action as opposed to, you know, for performances or for translations or people trying to memorize new words and new sounds? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, and I mean, we did follow uh, a, a bit of an addict of show by doing as well, um, but we... We really did want to highlight the language and, and use as much language as we can. Uh, so in the, we have a, a bag of, of a bunch of language things that have been cut. We're going to put together about a th probably a three, three and a half hour edit uh, wow. that will reintegrate all the language stuff that, that didn't uh, make this sort of festival cut or whatever uh so that it could be used as as a learning tool oh amazing i think we have a question uh, back here hi um thank you and an incredible film um i just like to wonder about there's a few scenes involving say the elders and the tobacco as well as the girls when they have to bring out the berries how did you manage keeping such what appears to be a very heavy film light at moments and balancing a tone throughout Well, I, I don't really know actually, but uh, <laughs> I think that I think that for us, that's that's kind of real life. Um, you know, when we went and and screened this in Alaska, it was it was uh, really tough for them because they had lost about six of their young people in the year uh, out at sea. So, um, you know, in a community of about 300. So, you know, that people were feeling, feeling the movie very personally, but they're still able to uh, laugh in those moments. And, and I think that's just how we deal as Indians uh, and, and in these small communities where we are. And uh, this has to be, unfortunately, our last question, uh, and it's coming over here. Oh, I was hoping to get two questions, but <laughs> um, so should I ask only one? Go ahead with the two. Okay. Yeah. So I was. This is might seem trivial, but I was really fascinated by the the particular tattoo that was on the brothers' chests. It looked like a bear, but it had exactly the same lines as totem designs. Um, can you tell me any more about that? Yeah, so um, one of the things, there, there's been a resurgence of, of traditional tattooing on the West Coast. And uh, so we could have s sort of artifacted those uh, tattoos on, but we gave all of our cast the opportunity of getting real tattoos and we brought in uh, uh, Corey Bullpit and Kiowa Jones, who are, who are, uh, tattoo artists that are doing that style. And so everybody got, uh, not everybody, but th those that wanted to got their hand poke, uh, tattoos done. So what, what happened in that case, because we knew that we were asking, um, of them, uh, something very personal and permanent. Uh, they were getting tattoos, not not necessarily to further the narrative of the story. These were uh, clan tattoos, tattoos that they they individually would 
would have the rights to wear and so so that's uh, that's most of the story behind behind what tattoos uh, people got um one of the one of the boys uh uh i don't know how i would oh the one that gives the cuts to aditsi right at the very end uh I felt really good about his tattoo because he knew a different story, a, st- a story that made him uncomfortable with the tattoo that he was had been thinking. And uh, I was able to bring him to Guaganat, who is my clan mother, and she has a story about the two-headed eagle and and was able to share with him and make him comfortable about getting that particular tattoo. And, and, uh, yeah, I felt really good about that one. So was it a bear? Uh, are you thinking on the two two lead brothers? Uh, yeah. So, uh, Kwa has a beaver on his chest Uh. and Aditi, I believe he, he, yeah, Sea Grizzly. So, so generally the same framework, but, but, uh, different sides. So, um, Tyler is a raven, and uh, and Willie is an eagle. So they're from different clans. Right. Okay. This is a more serious question. There was a language initiative. Um, Diane Brown was involved in it, but it was years ago. Uh, was she involved in the film as well? Yeah. So so Diane Brown is Guaganut, and she she is my primary source. So. Um, Throughout the script writing uh, process, I went to her uh, kind of almost for every decision. I I try and pile up the decisions that we're working on and and bring them to her. But um, and then uh, she, so we consulted with her throughout the script writing process to make sure that we weren't. Um, leaving the the Haida universe that we weren't making things up or that that we're correct in our in our approach that this would work uh and then uh once we had all of our translations done it was diane and dolores who we came together with to a big mistake that we made in our process was we translated each side we translated the southern dialect and the northern dialect in a vacuum and there's all kinds of things that are important when you're addressing someone if they are you know where they exist in the hierarchy whether they're a younger nephew or older nephew what side of the clan so all these manners of addressing are specific and uh not only that, though, like um, it was just in some cases, it was just one half of a conversation completely. So we had to make sure everybody was talking to each other. So we brought them together and they were quite afraid to uh, work together. They they uh, thought, you know, they wouldn't get along, uh, that they wouldn't understand. And it was one of my favorite moments in the process. You know, they got along great. They understood each other. They're able to help each other in their respective dialects. Um, and, uh, and, and it was, I hadn't been so much involved in this project with the translation. So it was my big chance to uh, sink my teeth into the language part of it too. Well, I want to thank everybody for coming out to see the film. I want to thank you both for making such a wonderful, profound film and coming out to speak with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you.